Welcome back, everybody. It's now time to turn to the, the first uh, panel session of the conference, and it would be highly impertinent of me to define the title of, the, um, of, of this session by way of contrast to the former, but the title is Thinking About the Future of War, um, and it is my privilege to introduce the moderator of this session, Jens. Thank you very much, Ole. Um, some 15 years ago, when I was about to uh, give my first lecture at university ever, a uh, hundred people in the audience, I went to an older professor's office and asked him for some last minute advice. And he said, no, I don't have any advice. And then he looked up and he said, if you're not really prepared, wear a tie. <laughs> um, <laughs> if the three gentlemen here subscribe to that formula. <laughs> I take it, Peter, that you are pretty well prepared today. <laughs> um, it was the uh, Danish poet Storm P who once said that it's uh, difficult to predict, to make predictions, uh, in particular about the future. And indeed, sometimes it seems fairly futile, uh, future, futile activity to try to predict the future of strategic and military affairs. The only thing that appears to be really, really certain is that we're going to be surprised again and again. At the same time, there is no alternative to trying to predict the future of strategic affairs. Um, because the alternative, not thinking, about the future of strategic affairs is not a place where we, do we want to be. It would be meaningless and foolish. As officers and scholars responsible for the training and edu education of future officers, we have to develop ideas about the future of war. There's no way around it. With the title of this panel, <laughs> Thinking About the Future of War, we have tried to avoid the trap of Storm P that he warned us about. We're not aiming for very distinct predictions or tangible distinction, uh, predictions about the future of war. Rather, we are less pretentious, hoping to stimulate a bit of thinking about the future of war. Helping us thinking about the future of war, we have engaged three distinguished speakers. Um, and in, in a Danish context, uh, my guess would be that none of them would uh, really need an introduction. But I'll do it very briefly anyway. So we have Peter Wigger Jacobsen from the Royal Danish Defense College, also part-time professor at the Center for War Studies at the University of Southern Denmark. We have Professor Emeritus Martin van Krevel from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And then we have General James E. Cartwright, used to be commander of Stratcom and uh, vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, if you want to know more, they're all on Wikipedia. Uh, I checked it this morning. <laughs> A few words about the uh, rules of engagement here. Uh, each of you will have 20 minutes uh, for presentations. Um, and true to my Protestant upbringing, I'll be pretty harsh with the time here. It'll be 20 minutes, because that will leave us about 30 minutes for Q&A. So, without further ado, Peter Vigo, will you take it away? I'll try. Uh, when, I was in, uh, when I was a bachelor student, I remember going to a talk in the late 80s that was at the time when Anthony Giddens was really, really hot in the academic world. And I remember the poster that they used at the university uh, advertising the world's greatest lecturer. And I also remember the way Anthony Giddens started his talk by saying that, yeah, he was very sorry, the, the world's greatest lecturer couldn't make it, so he had come instead. And I feel a bit like that because obviously I'm not Lawrence Friedman, I have more hair. Uh, and the reason I'm standing up here is the fact that he couldn't make it. So you, you missed the world's, one of the world's greatest lecturer and you got me instead because I was the only one that could make it at such short notice. Uh, <laughs> You've basically just heard David Kilcullen describe what I think is going to be the future of great power war. What he just described, to my mind, is what the, the Russians and the Chinese 
are currently doing and is going to continue to do against us. Uh, so in that sense, he basically gave my talk. Uh, so what I'm going to do is going to tell you what the future of great power it's not going to look like, because it's not going to be conventional, and it's not going to be nuclear. And I'm going to use my 20 minutes to explain you why I think that's the case. Uh, and the reason why I thought that would be a, an okay topic to use for today uh, is the fact that there's already been some academic debate talking about the obsolescence of great power war. You had John Mueller making a, an argument that made a lot of waves in the late 80s, and then you had Steven Pinker making the same argument again in a little different uh, manner, saying that all, while, uh, all violence was declining and we were looking towards a much better future. Uh, he may be right, but I'm not Gonna, I'm not going to experience it. Uh, and there's also the other point that the fact that we haven't actually seen any direct uh, conventional fighting between great powers since the Korean War, where the Chinese got a little upset when the US got too close to its border, and it, they decided to push them back to where the current border between South and North Korea is today. And I guess that if the, uh, if the US tried to, to, to repeat the exercise, I guess the, the, the Chinese would, would do all the same thing again. But we are now seeing a number of people and more and more people criticizing this uh, suggestion that a great power war is a thing of the past and I think that David Kilcullen was also alluding to it when he mentions the fact that we might want, once again have to take on dragons. Uh, and if you've seen the latest uh, U.S. Uh, national strategic document that came out uh, late, late uh, last year, early this year, the U.S. again has designated uh, China and Russia as their primary security concern. They're no longer that concerned about terrorists. Now we're back to great power competition. So the big question that we then need to, to think about is whether is it feasible that we again will have to see uh, real fighting. Uh, I'm not talking about hybrid and all that sort of stuff below the conventional threshold, but I'm talking is there a chance that we might again have to take on other great powers uh, conventionally or even with nuclear arms? And is it feasible that you're going to see this between the US, the US NATO, uh, Russia uh, against uh, the US or China, uh, China, India, India, Pakistan? And is that, is that something that we need to worry about? Some of my colleagues, and I have an esteemed, very well-respected Swedish professor who's basically made the case that we're already seeing it, uh, the, 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 the beginnings of it in Syria. He was not the only one to worry that the US and Russia might actually get into a fight in, in Syria. Gorbachev made the same point uh, earlier this year. And, of course, Graham Anderson, probably he did not sell all that many copies of his PhD dissertation, Essence of Decision, so he came up with a very catchy title to uh, ensure that, uh, that he had enough to enjoy his retirement if he ever retires. So now he's basically making the argument that we're distant for a war between the, the US and China. And in order to promote his book in Denmark, he made a, an interview with a Danish newspaper arguing that we're actually much closer to a real war between the US and China now than when I wrote my book. So I'm sure that's going to boost his numbers. Uh, but I actually disagree with that. And I think that if you have to say something sensible using in, in, in international relations theory about the, the risk of future great power war, you need to look into the future relations between uh, the great powers uh, of today. And the interesting thing is to figure out whether the great powers are going to end up having the same kind of relationship as we see today between the, the European great powers or the former European great powers France, the UK, and uh, France, because war between them is these days unsinkable. They regard each other as friends, and therefore war is not a problem. Uh, but of course, if, if we get into a situation where the great powers view each other as rivals, as is currently the case, at least from the US perspective, when it's looking at uh, China and Russia, then it becomes more worrisome. And if they go all the way to actually begin to look at, to, uh, at each other, as enemies, as they did during the Cold War, when we're looking uh, at the Soviet Union and the US, then we really have a problem. And then war, war is something we should really worry about. So to my mind, if you want to a, a, make a guesstimate about the future risk of, of, uh, of, of war between the great powers,
triage, you have to come come up with a guesstimate of where we're going to end on this continuum with the great powers. And to do this, in order to place these, uh, this relationship, I, I go into the factors on the slide. Because if you look back at, at what fueled war, wars in the past, of course you have uh, ideology and religion as one of the key drivers of war. We had the 30 years war in Europe, and if you look at the Cold War, that was first and foremost an ideological competition between uh, the Soviet Union and, and, and the United States and NATO and the so-called free world. Uh, and once the, the Soviets collapsed, we sort of suffered from the delusion for a period of time that, hey, we had won, our system was the only system left standing, and Fukuyama made a ton of money making the argument that history has stopped. There was only one problem with his bestseller. It was never translated into Arabic. So therefore, Osama bin Laden didn't know that the history had stopped, and he came up with his own uh, ideological version of the perfect society. And we've been fighting them ever since, in the form of Al-Qaeda, in the form of the Islamic State. And if you look at the map of Africa, uh, and see all the ungoverned spaces there and the weak states, it's just a matter of time before we'll get the, uh, the brand of, uh, of that kind of problem that we'll then have to uh, uh, to fight. So the, the, the degree of uh, ideological and religious tension between the great powers is something that we need to watch. The other thing is the cost of fighting wars. If you have a situation where it's extremely costly for the great powers to go to war, then they're likely to think twice about it. And then some of you are probably, probably now going to remind me, uh, yes, yes, Norman Engel also said that prior to World War I, and nobody paid attention, and we got World War I. Yes, well, but something happened in 1945 over two Japanese cities, the invention of nuclear weapons. If you add that into the mix, and you have a situation where it's extremely costly for you economically to go to war, and you can also expect to, 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 to get attacked with nuclear weapons that you cannot defend against, then you have a really, really good and strong incentive to think twice before going to real war. And then the final factor that is also important to my mind is the uh, degree of institutionalization, the, the, the amount of rules, uh, the respect for international law, and all that. And of course, now you said, ah, but you didn't pay attention to the, U uh, to, to, to the news uh, last night when you had the, 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 the crisis between the Ukraine and Russia and their attempt to regulate the access to the South Sea. Or you didn't pay attention what happened to the Crimea. You didn't pay attention when the US uh, and the British and the Danes and the, uh, the Aussies attacked I Iraq without a, a clear uh, legal mandate from the, uh, from the UN. Of course, you can come up with all these examples. You can also point to the East and South China Sea and see what the Chinese are currently doing there to try and bend international rules. That has happened always throughout history. The strong has always tried to influence the rules and bend them as to fit their own interests. That's not going to stop, of course, but I think that the key, the key point here is that if you look at great power behavior, they actually follow the rules 95% of the time because it's in their own in best interest to do so. Uh, so it also did it depends to what degree that the, the great powers are actually happy with the system that they, uh, uh, they live in. Let's take either, e each of these factors in turn. I mean, in the, in the Cold War, of course, there was no doubt about the fact that you had the communist systems versus the, the, the Western systems, and there was a huge ideological di di distance between uh, China and, and the US and the West, and also between Russia and, uh, uh, and, and the West. That is no longer the case to the same extent. Uh, yes, uh, Putin is again trying to position his, himself as something anti Western, uh, because we are getting a bit too close uh, to, to, to Mother Russia. Uh, but basically, they are both capitalist societies now trying to uh, increase uh, their standard of living by integrating with the world market. And that makes a very big difference compared to what you saw during the Cold War. There's also a high degree of economic interdependence. <laughs> It may not have dawned upon Trump yet, but, but I think that uh, if you look at the numbers, it's going to be extremely costly for the US if they keep up the current uh, uh, skirmishes with respect to uh, terrorists and what have you. So uh, my, my guesstimate is that, that they may not figure it out when uh, they meet at the G8, G7 uh, this, this weekend, but my guesstimate is that if you look six months ahead, they would have come to some sort of negotiated uh, solution 
revolution or a ceasefire because if uh, the trade war really runs amok, then it's going to be highly destructive to both the US and China. And now the economy uh, will be interested in, in, in that outcome. And that, that's, sort of, of course, an entirely rational argument. And some people doubt the rationality of some of our world leaders today. But again, they are also constrained by structures that they cannot control or overturn in the short term. Same thing with Russia. We are much more economically intertwined with Russia than we were during the Cold War. And I think that you've seen mutual restraint in the way the West had handled uh, the, the, the conflict in, in the Ukraine. And you also saw it with the muted response we got to the crisis just happening over the Ukraine. Uh, some people have already criticized Trump for being clumsy and for basically saying that, you know, it's bad, it's bad, we, we, we really want it. But, you know, look at the reactions from the EU, look at the reactions from the UN. They said exactly the same thing in a more diplomatic and polite uh, language. But they basically also say, please sort it out. Don't fight. We don't want to hear about it. We've already been uh, gone through Gerasimov, and basically his, his, point, his, his take on future warfare is that if you want to take on the West, you need to stay below the conventional threshold. Because if you move abro uh, across, above that, then you're in serious trouble. So, you know, they're doing all they can to, uh, to do the stuff that David Kim Cullen just so admirably described to us, and he can go into that. I just will add that it's exactly the same with Russia. If you take their doctrine, or whatever you want to call it, on unrestricted warfare, it's essentially what uh, Gerasimov said uh, later on. Again, if you want to mess with the, with the West, don't take them on conventional, conventionally. Try to undermine them as best you can in peacetime without using conventional weapons because you don't want to fight them. So they're doing exactly the same, uh, using slightly different language. And if you look at the U.S. reaction recently, they started out by having a very aggressive concept for con containing China and had this uh, offensive air-sea battle concept. And then after a while, they realized that that was perhaps a little bit too offensive. So now, if you look, look at the new national defense strategy, their objective is to avoid military confrontations with the Chinese, which is essentially also saying that the U.S. really do not want to pick a fight with either the Chinese or the Russians either. And I haven't mentioned nuclear weapons yet. If you add that to the mix, I think it's very hard to come up with a scenario where you want to see any of these, uh, any of these uh, uh, major powers wanting to, to actually start fighting in earnest. Uh, and, and, if, and then you can say, oh yeah, but you know, wars happens by accidents. And you can go back in history and you can make the argument about, about World War I and all that and so forth. I think there was also a structure uh, and an alliance system that made uh, war more than accidental when we look at World War I. And there was also another view of the, uh, the use of military force where you had a different view of warfare than you have today. That also made that accident more likely. So I think that you still have uh, a fairly strong, uh, again, if you look at, for instance, uh, the Syria that has been used by uh, quite a few of my colleagues uh, saying that, ooh, there's a risk that the US and the Russians will end up fighting in, in Syria and it'll happen by accident because the planes are flying so close and all that sort of stuff. Whenever we've had that, I think we've seen the, both the US and Russia being very, very good at deconflicting and making sure that if they ended up fighting, it would not be by accident. There was one instance when uh, the Syrian government was using uh, Russian uh, mercenaries or whatever you, security firms, whatever you want to call them, uh, attacking uh, their Kurdish allies. So the US first called the Russians and said, what the hell's going on here? Do you have anything to do with this? And the Russians said, no, we don't. And then they died. Uh, so in that sense, the US wanted to be sure that they were not starting anything uh, inadvertently, that they were afraid they couldn't control afterwards. So, so I think that all the powers here are very conscious to try to get into a situation that might escalate. I would also argue, and that's uh, of course a rather controversial argument, that both the Russians and the, the Chinese are, are not that revisionist. Yes, the Russians uh, don't want us to get any closer to their border. They want us to stop uh, eastward expansion of the EU and NATO. But beyond that, they're basically playing by the rules. 
and you cannot exactly blame them for trying to, to, to pop up an old ally in Syria, their only remaining ally in, in, in the Middle East. If you want to be more than just a local or regional power, that's a sensible thing to do. And I guess if it, it had been a Western ally, we would probably have done something similar. And as for the US, well, they are sort of revisionist, uh, but primarily in the economic sphere. So my conclusion is, we don't have as much ideological conflict as we used to. We have a, a high degree of mutual economic interdependence. We have mutually assured destruction uh, militarily. And all, all the three major pa great powers actually benefit quite a lot from the existing water. So I don't expect uh, neither trade war or, or, or real war. Uh, I expect the uh, rivalry to grow, but I don't expect them to actually get into conventional or nuclear exchanges. Three things to watch as I'm running out of time. Uh, TX might get into this more, but of course, my argument is a, is a picture of the current situation, and that may change in the future. If the degree of e economic interdependence drops, then my argument would not be as valid. If somebody comes up with a new military technology that will give some of the great powers a first strike capability, then we're also in trouble. And if the Chinese get so fed up with the institution uh, set up that they start making their own uh, institutions and sh shutting out the US, as we're currently seeing in Asia, that is also a, a thing to watch. But other than that, I look forward to your questions. <laughs> Gentlemen, good morning. I'm afraid at the last moment I was told I only have 30 minutes and not 20. Uh, sorry, 20, not 30. So uh, I'll have to do it as quickly as I can. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference is about change. And in our technological age, everybody is all the time talking about the change. In fact, since we started this conference an hour or so ago, we've heard nothing except for change. Technological change, economic change, social change, political change, change A and change B, almost like, you know, uh, like in old McDonald's at a farm. And change here and change there, and so on, on, so on. Now, all of this is very important, but I thought that in your honor, I would do the opposite for change. <laughs> <laughs> And I would talk about the things that are not going to change, that have not going to change and will not change. And to give you a metaphor, think of a loom. The woof is quite as important as the warp. Without the woof, you won't have any piece of cloth. And I would say that, especially in the long run, the woof is probably more important than the warp. So what are the things that are not going to change? I only have a few minutes. First of all, the causes of war. Ladies and gentlemen, since the world began, there have been endless attempts to find out the causes of war. Was it a punishment of God, as in the Bible, as in the Christian tradition? Was it due to man's inherent aggressiveness, like his liking for punches? Was it stresses inside Soviet societies, the way Marx and Engels saw it? Was it the fact that each state or government or country had its own interests in mind and there was no world court to decide who was right and, of course, to enforce its decisions? You can argue about that forever. 
People have been arguing about it forever, but one thing seems certain. Whatever the causes are, they have not changed and they are not going to change. In other words, to quote Clausewitz, war is the continuation of politics by other means. Or perhaps I should say it should be the continuation of politics by other means. Because one of the greatest dangers in waging war is that war may slip away from political control. And I'll come back to that later. Without political control, war is, and I quote Clausewitz again, a senseless thing without an object. And woe to him or her who forgets it. Second, war is a strategic activity. That means that it is waged by two or more belligerents, each of whom has the right, the will, and the ability not only to try and achieve his own goals, but to actively prevent the other from doing so. You can't see it now, but I used to be a good athlete running marathons, okay? One thing you were not allowed to do as an athlete, you were not allowed to interfere with your competitors. That is the difference between a race and war, or if you will, certain kind of games. In war, you are allowed to do that. You are required to do that. And that is what gives war its unique, not unique because uh, it has the same character in common with many kinds of games, its dominant character. <laughs> the fact that you can interfere with the enemy and the enemy can interfere with you. It is from this strategic character of war that its basic principles arise, such as initiative, attack, defense, decision, attrition, concentration, maintenance of arm, maneuver, and so on, and so on, the number of principles that people have deduced from the principles of war is, uh, sorry, from the strategic character of war is almost endless. Whatever the principles are, they have not changed, they will not change. They were in force 10,000 years ago when, as far as we know, the first uh, Neolithic man waged the first war against the neighbors. They will be in war even if tomorrow or the day after tomorrow we'll have war with flying saucers flying through intergalactic space and firing lasers at each other. The same principles, and I don't have time to elaborate him here, the same principles will apply in future war as they have always done in the past. And then, ladies and gentlemen, war is violence. And particularly in conferences like this one, in a peaceful country with everybody wearing either a net unit uniform with lots of medals and or a suit and a tie like myself, nothing is easier than to forget this fact. So people talk about economic war and psychological war and uh, 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 and diplomatic war, and I don't know how many other kinds of war. They are not war, ladies and gentlemen. They are metaphors. Even shaping the theater of war, about which we heard so much today, shaping the theater of war, ladies and gentlemen, is not war. 
It is preparing for war. It is not war. What sets war apart is violence. And woe to him or to her who forgets it. This ever-present violence is precisely what makes war different from peace. It makes war the domain of hunger, of thirst, of fatigue, of suffering, of pain, of danger, of death, of regret, and of sorrow. And it is these qualities, and not the ability to stand in front of you know, people like you uh, and talk, which are needed in war. And it is because they have those people, uh, those qualities, more than we do, that all those Afghan types that we saw here are winning the war. Because they have it, and we do not. And let's not kid ourselves. In order to keep to fight a war, and it doesn't matter whether it was fought 10,000 years ago with clubs and stones, or in the future, which I don't know what kind of junk. You need cohesion, you need determination, you need presence of mind, you need endurance, and so on, and so on, and so on. Finally, since war is a violent activity, the possibility of escalation is always there. And not only the possibility, the likelihood. Side A delivers a blow. Side B delivers a response with a more powerful blow. And so on and so on. And soon enough, even if the war started as a perfectly rational act, a personal, perfectly rational def uh, response to something, it's only a question of time and very often a very short time until it escalates. Uh, and uh, people begin to, and it threatens to burst right through the artificial uh, medicals that people everywhere have tried to uh, put around it, okay? To put around it. War has this tendency. You start it, you think, oh, I know what I'm doing, I can keep it under control. Well, just ask Lyndon Johnson, just ask President Bush Jr., and so on, and so on, and so on, okay? They thought they could control it, and all of them either ha have gone already to defeat or are about to go down to defeat. So, let me sum this up. All of what I've been saying is true regardless of change, regardless of technology, regardless of organization, regardless of technology, a doctrine, and what have you, all those important things, we and so many others around the world in conferences like this, have been discussing forever. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is not what war is all about. Okay. In fact, contrary to what we heard here, war, the future, at least the future war, is very easy to predict. It will be exactly like the past in the most important things. And so, here in the peaceful West, okay, having enjoyed such a long peace, and having lost, as Westerners, one war after another for six decades now, at least, okay, it's almost impossible to find one war that Western forces have won since 1953, if 1953 was a victory, okay? 
we have been losing one war after another. Let's finally, finally admit it. Okay? Finally, finally, and admit it. We have turned into pussycats. <laughs> no question about it, okay? And if we really want to get serious, it is better that we uh, keep these things in mind. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm a retired pussycat. <laughs> um, I think the, the one caution that I, I do um, provide to you uh, before I start to speak is that um, you get infinitely smarter when you retire. <laughs> there, are, there are no questions you can't answer, um, and you should be careful of that. Uh, the other admonition here um, is, I mean, I, we've never be the last speaker in the group, you know. Um, you watch all of your talking points go away for, for three speakers and then it's your turn and you kind of look at your title and go, <laughs> it's not gonna work. We've seen the high end of war, we've seen the low end of war with exceptionally good presentations. We've seen the violence and the ugliness of war and the demarcations between what is war and what is not war um, and, and, a, and a, good, uh, a good discussion of that. So where I think I'd like to take you uh, uh, for just a few minutes is down more to the tactical level. Um, and I don't mean fighting tactics, but, but kind of what are we thinking about, what are we doing uh, right now, uh, and how are we thinking about the future. Um, that is not to cut off any questions. So ROE in the Q&A session is, if, even if we didn't talk about it, it's on the table. Please don't hesitate. Uh, I would hate for anybody to walk out of here with a question that they really wanted answered but were afraid because it wasn't in the topic line that they didn't want to ask. Um, when, I, when I start this, um, you know, there is uh, without a doubt, and you've heard it from all of the speakers today, a shift in focus. If you believe that there is some sort of an imaginary continuum from influence operations to nuclear war and then all of the things in between, the shift in focus to the left, which in the US we're calling left a boom, before the shooting starts. The shift in focus there of setting the conditions. There's a lot of technology that's being applied to this area, um, and you can imagine, I'm sure it'll come up in the next panel of talking about AI, et cetera, intelligence advances that have occurred there. But, but the key understanding here is that we don't have, particularly in the Western world, and particularly in the United States, is who's supposed to be in charge? Is this statecraft? Is this uh, covert or clandestine operations? Is it um, economic? Is it commerce? Um, who's really in charge left of boom? Okay, and who's actually orchestrating the scenarios? What is it we're trying to accomplish here? What is it we're trying to accomplish such that the first shot doesn't get fired? Or if the first shot does get fired, the end state has already been determined. I mean, that, that is the objective of left of boom. And the question is, who's in charge? And I think it's gonna remain an argument in governments as to who that should be. Um, it's gonna remain the senior most person's responsibility to integrate that activity within a governance structure, okay? But to have a coordinated approach to that activity is quite frankly in the US totally eluded us. Um, everybody says you, when they want money, they'll point to the military. When they want authority, they'll point to their own institution. Put me in charge and it'll all be okay. 
We haven't gotten a good coherent approach to the front end of this activity, okay? And we're being outmaneuvered in that venue easily by most all our peers and non-peers, state actors and non-state actors are all outmaneuvering us in the front end of this activity, okay? Um, I'd like to say, oh, here's good news. We've got new tools. We'll get better at understanding that environment. But the real focus needs to be on how do you organize and train and equip and execute in that venue. And we haven't figured it out. I'd like to put a prettier picture on that, but that's the fact, okay? So, point, first point. The second point um, are these constructs called offset strategies. Um, there are a couple of reasons why, at least on the U.S. side, um, we look at offset strategies. One is diminishing returns of existing capabilities. So we are organized in such a way that an institution is very good at incremental improvement but almost always it's the kiss of death to disrupt that institution with disruptive technology, disruptive tactics, disruptive approaches to a problem because the institution can't, can't assimilate it fast enough to make it work. So institutionally, we can take an airplane and we can make the next better, better airplane, next, next generation better, next generation better. And now we build the F-15, 16, 18 series and we just charge three times the price to go to the same speed, the same height, the same distance with a little better avionics for the next generation airplane. We're at diminishing returns. The cost of that difference is not practical, okay, number one. And it's the Admiral's statement of, I'm going to put myself in a position where I've got one exquisite ship on one coast and one on the other coast. And the, they'll never sink, but they'll never be in the right place at the right time, okay? No longer do you have the ability to mass fire. Fires, okay, and to persist in their fires, to have a combat load that's substantial enough that you're going to outlast your adversary on station. It's just not going to happen, not the way we're moving. So how do you fundamentally shift, and that's where you start to think about offset strategies. How do you start to bring in the innovations that are occurring in the private sector or have occurred in the military but have not been embraced? How do you start to bring in non-physical domains? You know, other than naming them after your children, having a different language, classifying everything there is to know about that domain so that everybody doesn't know anything. Um, and therefore it cannot be integrated. How do you start to think about change in large institutions? Because right now, the definition of a large institution is it doesn't change. It just incrementally moves along. And the pace of that increment is not driven by outside factors. It's not driven by your competitors, quite frankly. In fact, you'd rather fail than have it dri driven by your competitors most of the time. It is the most difficult challenge that you as leaders will face. It's not, it's not the violence. It's the wanting to have violence among yourselves because you can't change. You won't move forward. You won't move in a direction that, that the, uh, the adversary or your competitor is trying to drive you. And so offset strategies start to move there. What am I looking for in the next offset strategies? You know, it's, a guy, it's the duty AI, robotics, et cetera. But quite frankly, I think the biggest offset will come with space. Um, space will start to, to actually dominate um, activities. Why? We can't put 100,000 people in a theater and leave them forever. We can't afford it. Politically, it's not tenable and sustainable. To have that kind of footprint all over the world will assure you you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay, so how do you start to think about constructs of closing with adversaries at strategic distances and being able to execute maneuver, mass, work with fires, coordinated, et cetera? How do you start to think about that in a way that makes sense in a world where that's where it's gonna have to happen? Because quite frankly, as has been very clearly laid out, probing, you know, I'm, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna take this island, I'm gonna cross this border, because I think I can stay under the threshold and I think I can set the conditions so that I can stay under the threshold so the Americans won't react, okay? 
So that's a total failure in deterrence. How do you start to think about changing that dynamic? How do you start to think about organizing to change that dynamic? What does it look like? If I, if I go to the, to, the, to the next logical place, why do I think space is important? We've known for a long time with position, navigation, timing, movement of comms, movement of commerce now, etc. It's expensive. If I lay a fiber across the ocean and I put a satellite in the sky, a packet of information in the fiber is pennies on the packet. A packet of, of that same packet in space is dollars on the packet. Why? Because getting it there is expensive. Getting out of Earth's gravity well is expensive. What would change that con construct? Well, reusable. If I can fly 50 sorties on the same craft and amortize the cost against it, I can go to pennies per packet in space. That's why these concepts that you see from Amazon or Bezos and company and, and Musk and company are fundamentally going to change the game. When they stand up and say that I can get you from Washington to Sydney in 30 minutes for a, a business class ticket, that's a fundamental shift that is occurring that will also bleed over into warfare. If I can do that at strategic distances, now I can start to talk about not just precision fires at distance, but mass, mass and maneuver. That's a whole different concept. And people say, okay, that's way out there though. It's already built. And the, and the government and the military has not had to pay a penny. Okay, those are the partnerships that we're looking for, okay fundamentally different shaping of the game, okay? If I can be in, on the other side of the earth or any place on the face of the earth with a force, with the capability, with 60 tons of ammunition, I'm now defining a fundamentally different game, okay? It's, it's gonna have its strengths and it's gonna have its vulnerabilities. It is not to eliminate other things that we are doing or other domains, okay? It is to say that it is a differentiator and it's one that's probably a lot closer than we're thinking, okay? So I'll, I'll stop on that one uh, there, but, but glad to take more questions on it. Um, when I, when I look you know, further forward to the challenges, um, I thought probably the most interesting question that I've heard this morning is, so how are we going to train the people? Okay, I thought that was probably the most interesting question from my perspective um, that I heard this morning on this, in this discussion. Um, if we follow the model that we're in right now, and I'm gonna be extremely pejorative, okay? So I'm a, a new recruit, officer. I'm gonna be a pilot, okay? I'm, I'm gonna have a 30-year career, and you're gonna send me to school three times in that career. And for the most part, the curriculum's the same all three times, okay? Updated slightly by historians, whatever, or the personalities that run the school, or you pick it. Okay, we'll change names, we'll change where the seats are, but, but you're gonna teach me how to put my uniform on three times, you're gonna teach me how to be physically fit three times, and you're gonna teach me to read history three times, okay? The, the problem with that is that you are totally out of sync with the, the changes that are going on around you. And, and while, while you're in your first five to 10 years, you will be trained as a specialist. And then fairy dust is gonna be sprinkled on you and you're gonna be a generalist, okay? This is the school of fairy dust. Not pejorative, but okay, you've been here, you've got that check mark, now you can be considered for something else, okay? But it's not gonna be in your area of expertise, potentially, okay? So how are we going to train and, and educate and bring up generalists, number one? And number two, how are we gonna keep from over-specifying the other end of the spectrum? So we talked about the difference between an NCO and an officer particularly at the younger ages, okay? We just did a marvelous experiment in the Air Force which you will never hear about. <laughs> we took sergeants and corporals 
and taught them how to fly reapers and predators. And oh my God, they were better. <laughs> okay. My two masters in aero and, and IT against 10 years of doing this already. Okay. Does that mean that they all should be? No, but it does mean that we are going at this education thing wrong. Okay. I'll give you the classic example that I use on a regular basis with, with groups like this. Uh, when I had my first tour out of the cockpit, was being punished, um, I was put in charge of the R&D for the F-18, for making the F-18. Okay, we put together a great airplane and I took everything that I hated about F-4s and A-6s and things like that and put it into the F-18, made it a digital airplane, did all of that wonderful stuff. For seven years, we could not tell the pilots that the stick was not connected to the flight controls <laughs> because they just wouldn't do it. For five years, we had to put draw needles back into the software because the pilots couldn't tend tr tell trends of increases in altitude and speed and whatnot with a ne without a needle. It had to be a needle. It's, 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 it's the biggest challenge you have is bringing our own institutions along, okay? We're okay with change as long as it doesn't affect us. <laughs> the end of the day. I mean, it's, it's just kind of where we sit. Um, you know, and, 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 it, and it's very difficult to move your institution at the pace of the fight, okay? Um, the imperative of life and death is almost not enough. I mean, we do extraordinary things. We are right now trying to move into the digital age in, in the American military, okay, by building platforms, by building another airplane, by building, you name it. If I've got a problem and somebody appears on my flank, I ask the industrial base to go build me a different platform, okay. Now in retirement, when I'm infinitely smarter, I own a Tesla. And over the last two years, I've had the same physical body, but I've had five new cars. Okay, I mean, it's just this construct of the institution still looking to the platform as the solution to a tactical problem is killing us. It is just driving us down, removing mass, removing numbers, all of the things that we know are essential to winning wars, but aren't in the incentive structure, okay? And we have to figure out how we're gonna change that. Um, as, as we start to move forward. My biggest problem with my general officers is they become obsolete from an education standpoint in about one year. And the problem is everybody around them knows it, but they don't. <laughs> Okay, I mean, I got the t-shirt, I've been in more wars than you have, I've got more stuff on my chest than you do, therefore I'm smarter than you are. Don't question me, okay? What's the first thing you do when somebody walks into your office in the morning and the shit has hit the fan? You throw everybody out that doesn't look like you, okay? Your buddies all come into the room. The people you most trust that are most like you, you keep in the room. What's a surefire way to come up with a wrong answer? Okay, eliminate the diversity. Not just diversity in color and stuff, but diversity in age, diversity in experience, diversity in profession. How do you start to teach people that, that those instincts that we have have to be changed. It's part of why you are educated in order to change those things, to start to think differently about how you're going to look at it. And we have to figure this out ahead of our adversaries, okay? I mean, I, I have wonderful experiences at the National Defense University in Beijing and in Moscow, St. Petersburg. Okay, talking to their young officers, okay. They're no different, <laughs> okay. They're no different, okay. And what's the first thing somebody tells you when they walk into your, uh, when you walk into their organization? We're different. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> 
I'd like to believe that, but it's not the case. How do you start to build that into the education process? Where does gaming fit in? We did a huge disruption during the Afghan conflict over the past five or six years um, in medicine. Okay. We basically said no more doctors on the battlefield. They're always the wrong doctor at the wrong place. Triage is not the way to make things work. <laughs> we gave Corman one of these and we tied him into an emergency room and say Johns Hopkins or Boston General or whatever and said, okay, here's what I'm seeing. Okay, do the following three things and put it on an airplane and in 48 hours have it in the United States in a real emergency room that specializes in what the wound was that you saw in the pad. We went from a 60% survivability rate once wounded to a 95% survivability rate. Who hates this idea? Doctors. That's, I mean, because it doesn't fit into the litentious nature of protecting against being sued if you make a bad judgment. The fact that you save 95% of the people doesn't matter, okay, to some extent, okay. At some point, it starts to win out. <laughs> but, but it's just endemic of the challenges that we have in leadership in being ready to take on the future. Okay, we're all embracing the future, we're all gonna be ready for it, as long as it doesn't change the way we think. Okay, and so I stop at that point. I mean, my message here is, is really one to think about the human element. Think about the way we have been organized. Does it fit what we actually need to do in the future? What does education look like? How can we better educate our people in real time with real problems? Um, where does gaming fit in? Because I'll tell you, gaming has been a huge part of it. And I'll end on this anecdotal piece. We wanted to prove, we asked the National Academy of Science, you know, give me a hard problem. Uh, I wanna be able to understand how I find the savants in a crowd, okay? In a population, how do I find the savants? And so the answer th that they came back to us was, we have worked for 15 years on trying to figure out how to unfold the RNA molecule so that we could look at it for, for, for anomalies associated with AIDS, okay? but we've never been able to do it. We have five teams internationally working this for over 15 years, okay? So a little organization that we, David and I, have played along with for, for a lot of years called DARPA, said, okay, we're gonna create a game. It's called Fold It. We're gonna put it on the internet and we're gonna let people take a look at how they might do it and they'll build teams and they'll do it virtually and they'll compete. And if you're not good, you get voted off the island, all right? But, but you keep going. In 11 weeks, we solved it. 11 weeks. Nobody on that team had ever met each other. Nobody on that team had an advanced degree. There are ways to think about education that are non-standard that we have to start to figure out here. We have to start to move in a direction that gets us a little more out of the brick and mortar side of the equation and a little more into the day to day so that, so that the opportunities for being able to compete in this environment stay fresh, the ideas are passed in a way that makes sense and that allows us a free interchange and that we are not trapped in a looks like us problem solving problem uh, construct. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much, all of you, for enlightening us uh, and making us uh, smarter on the continuity and change uh, in the future. We now have about 30 minutes for Q&A, and, &A and uh, I guess it could be about change, it could be about continuity. And if no one wants to go first, let me then exploit Torben. Go ahead. Thank you, very Thank you very much. My name is Torben Mason. I'm the Chief of Navy Staff. My question is for you, Peter. 
now when we know that the risk of possible war has been cancelled, then should we then just accept that Russia deploy massive amounts of troops close to the Baltic states, position as can the missiles in the Kaliningrad, deploy submarines to the GRUK gap, our center of gravity, and build airstrips in the high north? And if we add to this the growth zone uncertainty, then my question is, in reality, what comes first, the hen or the egg? Do we, okay, I didn't know. Uh, is it on? Yep. Yeah. Oh. No, it's not. No, it's on, yeah. That, that was not the point of my presentation. I think that the way we've addressed this in NATO is by doing all we've done in NATO since uh, 19, uh, sorry, uh, 20, 2014. We've set up the tripwire and we've done the stuff that we've done. Uh, we've started increasing our defense spending all, and all that with the point of actually deterring the Russians from doing what you just alluded to. So I'm not saying we should just sit back and do nothing. Uh, what I'm watching is, is the great powers gearing up to deter each other and to continue the game of crisis management that they've played since since the Cold War, essentially, or since World War II. So I'm not saying we should not do anything. I'm not saying what we've done in NATO is wrong. What I'm, well, my, 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 my argument is that, that we're actually doing what we need to do. And my problem is not so much the conventional bit and the nuclear bit, because we've been doing this, and uh, you guys in uniform are, you know, expert at doing this. My problem is what has been described in David's presentation and also by the general Cartwright's presentation, how we do the stuff below the conventional threshold, how we organize for that, how we complement the traditional military stuff with all this new stuff so that we maintain deterrence all the way down. That's my key problem. So I'm not saying you shouldn't have your ships and we shouldn't have all that, but I also buy the argument that perhaps we shouldn't in invest all our money in huge, expensive, legacy platforms. <laughs> Okay, we'll collect a couple of questions at a time. So, Niels Bo and then Henrik, take two questions. Then I'll first on the left side. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Dr. Niels Bo Poulsen from the uh, Danish Institute of Military History here at uh, the Defense College. Um, um, in his uh, morning presentation, um, um, Professor Kjell uh, provided primarily an evolutionary uh, um, uh, approach to, to uh, uh, military change, um, painting a picture of um, um, a trial and error and, uh, and uh, adaptation. Um, uh, I think a little bit maybe the cultural component was left out of, of, of that um, uh, presentation. Uh, in, in some of the presentations now, uh, we were um, we trust a little bit upon the influence of uh, institutional culture uh, at um, adapting to change and uh, and uh, thinking uh, thinking technological genes. My question to you, uh, inspired a little bit by Dima Adamski and his works on uh, military um, adaptation, is uh, uh, is the title of this this first session actually correct, thinking about the future of war in a, a kind of a singular uh, uh, way. Um, I mean, do we actually think the same way globally, or are we const highly constrained by, by, by our societies and by our culture? Is there a distinct Western way of thinking about the future of war which you in the panel represent? Take, take one more question. Anyway. So thank you very much for three uh, incisive and, uh, and, and very, very good uh, presentations. I, I have a question for, for General Cartwright. Um, I very much appreciated you, all your insights on uh, the, the challenges of, of, uh, of educating and training uh, military officers for, for their entire career and the, the problems uh, that, 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 that comes from that in a, in a very changing uh, environment. And so I would like to ask you a deceivingly simple question. If there was no PME system, so the professional military education system, in the United States, how would you build one? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first here? <coughs> yep. I'll take the last question first. If I can figure out the electronics. Um, you know, my sense is that um, 
what you're looking for is a broad enough base in diversity to become a generalist, so that the skill that you have is connecting the dots, being agnostic about where the dots come from, but being sure that you sample si your sample size is large enough that you can make a reasonable assessment, okay? And so, um, for me, one time through the, the PME system is, is important, okay? Um, and, and that might be better at the earlier stages than later, okay? And then after that, I'd like to see at least one tour, uh, one shot in an academic institution, non-military or non-government. I'd like to see at least one opportunity in a, in a, as an intern in a major business, not in your area of expertise. Um, and then I'd like to see one of those, not the PME, repeated again as a senior officer, as, as a general. Um, if, if you're allowed to do that, then you're, you're, you have a better opportunity of broadening your horizons. Because let's face it, we're human. Uh, if somebody sends you to a school, one, you're trying to fig figure out how you can be rescued from the school early uh, and sent back to your unit, then the next thing you're thinking about is how do I get through this with a good grade? Well, the way to do that is do what I already know. Okay, and so the incentive structure really ends up being wrong. And, and so I'd rather see us get away from that. And you know, for us, um, sending a logistician to FedEx makes no sense, but unless that they're just looking for employment later, okay? But sending a pilot to FedEx or a artillery officer to FedEx makes a lot of sense, okay? Um, or to, to Google or you pick it. And so um, one, you start to infuse current technology, current thought process with a different incentive structure obviously on the outside, back in. So you start to think about problems from different perspectives. Two, you have a better embracing of a broader culture group. In other words, if, if the shit hits the fan in the morning, I'm more apt to broaden my horizon and bring in more people rather than less. Okay, Therefore, more diversity. And so those are the types of things that I would like to see infused at larger scale into the PME system writ large. Um, on the issue of uh, institutions and how to think about culture um, and how to try to, to come at that from a, a problem of um, building in safeguards against doing it. I mean, what, we tr what, we, what we'd like to do, at least what I've seen from my own service, and so you're a product of what you, what you do, is but, but this construct that we built in the Marine Corps of the strategic corporal really starts to get at breaking down those institutional barriers and, and at least opening them up to a thought process that is more diffused in authority than a Napoleonic hierarchy structure, okay? It's still there. If I tell the corporal to jump, I want him asking on the way up how high, all right? I, I mean, you want instant obedience on the battlefield. You don't want that questioned. But the idea of letting that corporal think and act strategically is not counter to discipline. Um, if nothing else, it actually will reinforce it at a lower level because it'll experience the failure of discipline and what that does to you. So to me, you know, diffusing that down, spreading out authority, teaching authority even if you don't intend to give it, because they'll understand the counter side of that, is, is how you break down some of these institutional barriers. Uh, I had a very difficult time at STRATCOM breaking down the institutional barriers on uh, command that for 50 years had done nothing but nuclear weapons and the average rotation base in that command was 18 years in other words that's how long you stayed at one headquarters it was insane and then you add space missile defense cyber etc and they all go well we'll handle that stuff too no no way no way but but over time now that command has become much more about fires than it has been about nukes and how do I start to think before nukes prevent nukes alternative to nukes all, all of those kinds of things so so, to me, you have to change organizationally and you have to change fundamentally at the human level. Thank you, General. Martin and Peter, do you have any comments on the, the culture of war and, the, and a distinct Western type of war? The question from, from Niels Bo here. Yeah. 
Did you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> there, there, was, there was a question about whether we are actually preparing for a distinct Western type of war. If there is a distinct Western culture of war, or and 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 so should the name of the conference, in fact, be the futures of war? That's a difficult question. Uh, I think the West has been waging war against its own mirror age uh, image for too long. Okay. Uh, at which it's very good, it's natural. You try to fight somebody, and war is an imitative action, activity. If you fight somebody, you're going to become like him in many ways. Okay. If you fight a monster, you're going to become a monster. If you start a fight against an abyss, the abyss is going to look back at you. Uh, and we have been trying, I think, in the West, trying to prevent this uh, at all costs. Because we were afraid and are afraid to become like Hamas, to become like Hezbollah, to become like the Mujahideen, to become like, uh, uh, like, like so many other of these terrorist organizations, if you will, ISIS, okay? If you fight them in earnest, uh, you're going to become like them, whether you like to or not. So we have been doing everything we could not to fight them in earnest, so as not to become like them, and the results show. The results show everywhere. So the real question is, how do you fight, or where is the compromise, where is the line between fighting them seriously and fighting becoming like them. We in Gaza are a very good example. Okay? I remember years ago I went to the, what is called this, the, the settlements around Gaza to see those rockets. As Arafat once said rightly, they weren't dangerous, uh, dangerous enough in order to fight, you know, to terrify even a cat. But now, on the one hand, they have become much more powerful and much more dangerous. On the other hand, they are scaring uh, one of the most militarily, technologically, one of the most highly developed countries in the world, okay? So they must have been doing something right, and we must have been doing something wrong. It is recently they who are dictating the terms, they who are shaping the government, the, the battlefield, and not we. How do you come, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that without becoming like them? Okay. And to tell you the truth, uh, I, I don't know. But I do know that these things should be thought about and have not been thought about so far, least of all, in this conference. Thank you for that question. Okay, we have uh, two times David on the list. David, <laughs> will you go ahead? Uh, thank you very much. I, I also would like to ask uh, Professor Van Greveld uh, a direct question. So you you, you mentioned I, I agree completely. We've we've lost six decades of wars. Uh, don't see a much sign of us uh, changing that. But in the in the long view, having been in this business for so many years now, and uh, as a historian. Uh, what do you think, uh, what does it matter? When when do the chickens come home to roost? Do they ever? Um, can we continue? What sort of glide path are we on? Uh, as uh, James once said, in the long run we're all dead. Okay. Nothing matters in the long run, and being one of the oldest here, uh, I think <laughs> I can say so. You get her. You get her, okay? But uh, in the short run, there are struggles to be waged, and if possible, to be won. And one thing seems to be quite certain to me, that we in the West, and that includes practically everyone who tried, and 
and practically uh, every war, we lost, okay? We lost. We lost from 1945 uh, on practically every, uh, every war. And you know, there used to be a time when my own country used to serve as a model for a country that an army that had not left, uh, lost its fighting spirit, that was still able to fight and do original things and find original solutions and do and win victories. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is long past. And the reason why it's so long past, I think, is because, and this applies to you as well, because we consider ourselves strong and uh, we look at them quite rightly as weak. And if you fight the weak for very long, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to become weak. And if you use a sword and plunge it into salt water, that salt is going to rust. We have been fighting the weak so for so very long that the opposite from the famous phrase by Tukididas uh, applies. Okay. I know <laughs> Tukididas used to be taught, maybe still is taught at the Naval War College. Okay. The most famous passage in the whole of uh, Tukididas, uh, the best parts are the speeches and those he invented. <laughs> Never mind that. The most famous passage in the entire book is the million dialogue, where the Assyrians try to enforce their will on the small little weak uh, millions. And at one point, you know, the millions say, who are very small police, they say, look, what you're doing to us is not nice, it's not ethical, it's not this and not this. And the Assyrians say, and I quote, of the uh, gods we believe and of men we know that the strong can do what they can and the weak do what they must. Mr. Tokididas, I can see your point, but the whole of Western history since 1945, including our own in Gaza, shows that the opposite is equally true. It is the weak who do what they can and the strong who suffer what they must, okay? It is the weak who do what they can. It is the strong uh, who uh, suffer what they must. And that is why we have been losing and losing and losing and losing. And if you ask me, I'm just a military, an uh, ex-military historian actually, because I do different things now. Uh, if you ask me how do you get out of that, the answer probably in the long run is yes, we are all dead. <laughs> on that happy note, we'll go on to uh, David. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I have a more of a comment than a question, um, and it's it's about this cultural issue. I think we need to be very cautious about the danger of conceptual envelopment, right, where we have a definition of war that is dramatically narrower than our adversary's definition. Because in that case, two really dangerous things can happen. One, we can be at war with an adversary and we don't realize it, right? They're engaging in what they consider to be warfare, but it doesn't fit our particular narrow definition, and so we don't start to respond until it's too late. And then the second Second is that we can be taking actions that we don't think are war, that our adversary interprets as acts of war. Um, for example, trying to get Ukraine to join NATO, right? Um, so I think that I, I would make that comment. And then I want to just push back very slightly on this issue of that we've been losing wars for 60 years. Um, if you think about it at the unit of analysis of war, I think that's definitely a true statement. But if you think about it at the level of campaigns, there are 
a number of campaigns that we've actually won, and those campaigns have some things in common. Um, I'm going to set aside 1991, the Gulf War, right? That's the war that was glorious and awesome, and we've been trying to recreate that forever, ever since, and every adversary has figured out to not fight us that way, so I'm, I'm not going to include that one, uh, even though I th you could count it as a victory. But the three really significant victories we've achieved at the campaign level in the last 20 years were the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, the surge in 2007, and the recapture of Mosul uh, and Raqqa in 2016-2017. And all three of those had a number of characteristics in common. One, a very light footprint, elite ground force composed of both civilian and military components from CIA, Intel Services, Special Ops. Secondly, an extraordinarily strong air component providing targeting ISR and fires. And three, a reasonably large, not very capable local partner ground force. So it took us seven and a half weeks to overthrow the Taliban in 2001. On the day that the last Taliban Taliban stronghold fell, 7th of December 2001, there were 310 CIA and about 2,000 military in country. But we had every B-52 in the Air Force dropping bombs to support the effort, roughly about 500 sorties per day. And we had 50,000 Afghans fighting on our side against the Taliban. So there's a formula there, right? We haven't cracked it, but I, I, I think that there's, there are things in there in the record of the last couple of decades that are worth exploring. Because it's not an unbroken record of failure. There are some bright spots that are worth thinking about how to copy. So it's about transforming successful campaigns into victory, basically. Uh, question? My name is Christian Fischer. Uh, I'm uh, from DIIS, Danish Institute for International Studies. Uh, I have a question on uh, decision-making in, uh, in wars and in avoiding wars. Um, no matter what uh, what enemy you would be looking at for, for war, quick decision making is of course, quick, solid, professional decision making is of course essential. And um, and the, no matter whether you look at China, whether you look at Russia, whether you look at terrorists or extremists, of course they have a uh, uh, at the outset a, an advantage on, on, on that matter because they can make very quick decisions. Um, and uh, since we all know that, that quick decision making is a, a center of gravity in any sort of uh, 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 crisis or, or, or war, what is your what is your take on on, on this? Uh, there's always a trade-off between uh, when you when you look at uh, pre-delegation or authority, uh, where you uh, uh, would still have a very high degree of political control. But are we good enough at the uh, at the uh, at the at the moment and in the foreseeable future to making the right choices? And are our decision makers good enough? Do you think to uh, to be are they pre well enough prepared to make the quick decision making? We, of course, stand at a, uh, at a situation where we would look at this not only as nation, but also in multilateral uh, engagements such as, as uh, NATO. And with that, of course, also follows that if we're not good enough, what needs to be done? Anyone who wants to have a go at Martin? <laughs> Definitely. The mic is right in front of you. Maybe I'll, I'll just say a few words and hand the microphone to uh, Cartwright, who is a bit more qualified than I am. Uh, one of the, the most important or characteristic things about uh, warfare in the last 70 years or so is that the guerrillas are always faster. They're always elusive. They're always difficult to find. By the time you want, you, 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 you catch them, they're gone, and so on, and so on, and so on. It is always there, they who are faster, okay? And even if they're not, and if you kill some of the commanders, as you've gone down, and as we've done, you still are slower, right? And I'm not sure why that is. I think that is something you're much more able to discuss than I am, because you've got the experience. But it seems to me that it has something 
to do with the very nature of the modern military, with its uh, top-heavy uh, uh, bureaucratic kind of organization, uh, which guerrillas and terrorists and so on simply don't have. And it is the things that they do not have, not the things that they have, the things that they do not have, which make them so elusive and so hard to catch. And I'd very much appreciate it, General Goodwin, if you could tell me whether there is something to what I've been saying or whether I'm just talking out of my head. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my, is this on? My sense is um, normally, uh, at least in my experience, uh, we kind of turn it around and, and we say, what are the venues by which I can increase decision time uh, against an adversary, um, rather than trying to figure out how to sleep faster? Um, I mean, you always make your decisions in ambiguity. Uh, that, that just goes with the territory. You're never going to have everything you want to know. Um, new technologies associated with the intelligence side of the equation and whatnot are helpful, but at the end of the day, oftentimes create more questions than answers. And usually the biggest extender of decision time is the political legal apparatus that you operate in. You, you have to work through that. It will be different for different conflicts, but you want to be careful and mindful that you don't get trapped into, well, if this were really a war, I'd do it this way, um, because that will, that will get you in trouble also. Um, but uh, I remember long discussions with um, Dalievsky um, on decision time when I was a STRATCOM commander. And, and our, both of us worried that because of short decision cycles, because of quick launch on alert capabilities, that we would not be able to reasonably assess the intent of each other's activities. Um, and uh, it was not, let's build a, a, a faster circuit. It was really more along the lines of how do we build organizationally into our structures capabilities that will extend decision time. And I'll talk to one that I championed and is still remains very controversial, which is missile defense. Missile defense by my counterparts on the Russian Soviet side at that time and the Russian side, and I both agreed that missile defense would be a venue by which you could extend decision time. Okay. It would eliminate cheap shots, it would eliminate me mistakes, etc. It didn't have to be perfect, okay, um, etc. But, but having an adversary, one that is willing to have a conversation with you, which is not always going to be the case, for sure, um, uh, and, and understanding the risks associated with short decision cycles, particularly at strategic nuclear uh, venues, etc. Um, you know, I've learned at least to try to figure out how to build into the war construct decision opportunities. And then this idea that we can't do good decision making without a lot of diversity, uh, to me, is one that has, has really challenged my thinking, trying to figure out how to bring diversity into a crisis. Um, uh, I think without divulging, you know, uh, specific episodes, the likelihood that you're going to get 10 top-level diplomats on the phone at the same time for a crisis is zero, no matter how good the phone circuit is, okay? As, as one president said to me, you can't get me out of the bathroom that quick. Okay. Um, so, so crisis decision making oftentimes is more in your head than it is in the reality of the outcome. Okay, you, you put a crisis cap on it, you have decided you must act quickly. Um, 
and oftentimes you make the crisis yourself in your own imagination. So um, trying to figure out how organizationally to bring as much diversity to the decision process as possible, accepting the fact that you will not have all of the facts, and then operationally to demonstrate to your adversary that no matter what they do, the end state will not change. Okay, we have time for one quick question, General Bartels. Thank you very much, uh, Knut Bartels, uh, a retired general. I would like, just like to confirm what General Calvright has said, that is, we retired generals had a very clear picture of the decisions which should take place. So those of you who are in charge, please make the best use of us while we are still around. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to come back to Professor van Krevel's remarks uh, quoting the ancient writings. And it will start by a quote by what the wise Romans did to the victorious generals during a, uh, when they came back to Rome. And uh, they were paraded, parading through the city of Rome. There was always a slave standing behind the victorious general holding the laws above his head and stating in his ear, memento mori, you are but a mortal. We are dealing with mortals, be it in the military organization or in the political organizations. And those mortals have to make decisions, often under very difficult circumstances. And I absolutely share the perspective of John Cartwright that we will never have the full picture whenever we make decisions. Only fools believe they will have the full picture. They're always part of a gamble in decision making. But how do we train those people? If I were to look at the three panel members, I would ask from each of you one simple piece of advice. How do you, would you suggest generals and admirals should be trained? And make it short. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> short answers to a difficult Thank question. You. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, before I do so, you see, I was quoting more or less another Roman general, Marius. And what I said about war being the province of hunger and thirst and fatigue and so on, straight from a speech that he made to the Senate, I think in 103 BC. Okay? But now to your question, it's easy because I once wrote a book about it. I've written a book about almost everything. <laughs> <Man up. Okay. laughs> <No? laughs> I mean, I'm 73 years old and I've written uh, done this for 45 years, so no no wonder. Uh, I'll give you the scheme, okay? <laughs> Gratis. Okay. And not just for general, but for training in general. Okay? Not just training for the top, but from the bottom. You start with discipline. People coming into the military have to learn how to obey orders. Once you have taught them discipline, you taught that you teach them skills. Comes after discipline. You tell them, you teach them how to carry a load, how to fire a rifle, how to fire a mortar, how to drive a tank, and so on and so on. First, each soldier separately, then, in teams, and the teams become larger and larger, okay? You start with a team of one, a team of three, a team of 12, of 10, and so on and so on. First, the, the training is one-sided. They have to, uh, this is a question of skills, how to know, to know how to do what. At a certain time, uh, part, it must become two-sided. I'll quote another Roman time general, uh, Josephus Flavius, okay? And I'll quote what he says about the Romans. Uh, for the Romans, war is training without blood, and blood is training without war, with, uh, uh, with, with war, with blood, with blood, okay? So you start with one-sided exercises, you go on to two-sided exercises. This is, has become very, very dangerous because of the power of modern leg, uh, uh, weapons. So starting from the end of the Middle Ages, when you had the tournaments, which were two-sided training, okay? 
you more and more will have difficulty in organizing two sizes training. Now, however, we have all those wonderful video games. We can have two sided training or multi sided, if you will, without the danger. How wonderful. Here, I would like to add something else, which may be very, very relevant. I don't know, but I think it's probably very relevant to the Danish military. Okay? Plato, another old, old, old guy, okay, once said that any training that does not involve some danger is bound to degenerate into a childish game. Did you hear that? Okay. So we got to the point where it's a question of two-sided training. The higher you get, however, the harder it is to really simulate war. Training should obviously simulate war as closely as possible. You cannot do, it's relatively easy to do when you're commanding a, a battalion. It's much harder when you're in charge of an army or a country. So this is where higher theoretical training comes in. This is where I would say that most most war college students in the West are much too old, okay? By the time to the worst they get to the worst colleges have taught in them, they're, they're hopeless. It's not their fault, they're just too old, right? Training at the war colleges should start at maybe 33, 34, at the age at which Plato, again Plato, says that people should start studying philosophy. History comes first, theory comes last. The reason being that uh, you cannot teach everything on the ground, okay? It just cannot be done. Theory is the highest, and its objective should be to enable people to get the the kind of principles that will help them when they uh, uh, function in reality. Now, I don't, as you said, I want to keep this a huge subject. I've written two books out it, <laughs> each in its own way. I don't, I could go on, but it would be a waste of time and energy, and we all want lunch, okay? Uh, so let me just end uh, by coming back to my lecture. These things have not changed, they will not change, okay? And they are, as the general said, among the most difficult and the most important. Thank you. I shall now abuse my privilege as a chief moderator and cut the discussion short as we are literally eating away the lunch break. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, we'll be, we'll be uh, reconvening again 20 past one and please join me in thanking the panel and the moderator.